everything which we are doing in the blockchain and crypto space is very, very visible. We do not need to have the customers know that they have to do X amount of steps and this is the technologies involved and so on and so forth because the idea really should be that they should all be at the back end. What really matters is the consumer experience at the front of it. And until that happens, we will not be in a position to create the world that everybody talks about enabling through the use of these new technologies. Maybe one more. I don't know if everybody knows who this is. But he's a very good guy when you talk about consumer experiences and expectations. There are some books by Williams we should read. The first step in exceeding your customer's expectations is to know those expectations. We are sometimes creating technology for the sake of technology, not understanding that people will find a way to use it. That's not the point of it. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, but if we want to make it a global movement, then we need to pay attention to this. And last but not least, don't let the mixed signals fool you. Indecision is a decision. Now I'm going to leave it to you to figure out who said that, right? Uh, the point is, if you think that you have an amazing product, you're using the best technologies, you're providing the most security, but the users are not picking it up, that's not an indecision on the part of the customers. They are trying to tell you something. That is a decision they are making to not use what you're providing. So we need to look at ourselves and say, are we really delivering it in a way that they want to consume what we are creating? It's very important. Indecision is mostly said, we have a great product, we don't know where we are going wrong, we probably need to do more marketing. Maybe that's not the answer to everything, right? This is very, very important. The question I'm asking you is, what are you doing to make your users, consumers, and customers happy? Are you really enabling the people-led and technology-based revolution? Because I think that's what we are here for. Everybody here is not trying to just make a fast buck because behind that is to say, I need to have a new way of working. I need to have a new way of consuming. And this is how I see my value system fitting with the rest of the world. And unless we address it, it's probably not going to work. So we have a great story to tell at what we are doing at Close Cross, uh, but we're not going to do this in 10 minutes. Uh, if anybody's interested, please come by and we'll be happy to talk about how we are addressing some of the things which we have just said and we'll be most happy to learn as well from more consumers if we are still in the space of needing improvement. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Paweł Kuskowski. I'm trying to figure out the, the prompter, you know how it works, where should I indicate this? It doesn't work, guys. So before we start with slides, you know, so as I said, my name is Paweł Kuskowski, I'm CEO and co-founder of CoinFirm. I don't know how many of you are familiar with our, you know, company. We are on the market for over three years. Ah, there you go. Over three years and, you know, our, you know, our backbone is basically anti-money laundering solution for cryptocurrencies and, and blockchain. Uh, this is what we are doing, this is what we are doing around the world. Uh, and. You know, I was asked by the organizer here to show the latest, you know, to talk about the latest piece of work which we've done on for the market, basically. And this is part of our, let's say, you know, uh, broader range of offering is analyzing the, the exchanges market, right? And talk about the report which we, which we published. Um, but, in, you know, before we, we talk about the report, you know, you probably saw this, you know, uh, you know everyone is talking in the industry about hacks, right? You know, hacks are, you know, fantastic for us, right? Because what we are doing is like, we have the technology which allows us to follow every hack in the right scenario, right? So where the funds are going, you know, where is, you know, all the tracing basically. And what we've done also, you know, we've done almost live, you know, publishing on the Binance hack, uh, you know, where the funds are going. Really exciting part. You know, very good publicity for us. I don't know how many of you watched this uh, happening. Anyone? Right. 
So it's like it's it's really you know interesting. So this is this is what we do. We analyze you know transaction in cryptocurrencies, and we see who what are the let's say patterns of transactions, who is behind the transactions, and interestingly enough, um, you know very big part of uh, this let's say ecosystems is is exchanges, right? Exchanges is you know uh, around. 90% of cryptocurrency transactions are happening in on you know in relation to exchange right so this is you know the exchanges uh, in cryptocurrency world are very important increasingly important but at the same time they are bringing a lot of systemic risk you know in the sense that you know if they get this wrong they're going to have some really big problems Right, so you know, and the, you know, to from our perspective, one, you know, so everyone is talking about you know, like fake volumes, uh, you know, hacks happening. But from my perspective, and you know, I explain to you why it's important for me. It's it's this is the anti money laundering KYC framework, and this is something which you know we we we, we said from the start when we started the company. You know, this is going to be you know critical for um, for the cryptocurrency world, and it's actually it is critical. You know, for a number of reasons. Uh, the number of reasons, which is basically, you know, if these companies don't care, if the exchanges don't care about this world, right, they don't care about your money as well. Like, really, you know, this is, this is reality. If, the, you know, they don't think about, you know, who is behind the transaction, you know, who is the, the counterpart of the transactions, where the funds are coming from, you know, whether from hack or from fraudulent activity or from legitimate source, they actually don't care about you know uh, your money as well. So we analyze uh, you know in our report in you know uh, and this is part of our large database. We analyze over 216 exchanges around the world, top exchanges which basically uh, are responsible for 90% of of transaction of the exchanges. And we put this as part of the you know your exchange report which you can find on our website. It was also part of the Coindesk, Cointelegraph uh, articles. And what we find out, you know, it's really interesting, you know, findings which we have, you know. What is important with exchanges, you know, and you need to, you know, you as a client of or operator of the exchange, right? You know, you need to be aware that uh, sometimes you think that, you know, the exchange is set up, you know, and operating in the UK, for example, right, or in Malta. But in reality, it's operating from, you know, Cayman Islands or somewhere else, right? And we have you know, some great examples. So, you know, Binance, you know, which also operates here, effectively does not have headquarter, right? Why is it? Why is it actually you know interesting from from my angle? It's who they you know which regulatory regime they are following, right? Who is responsible for overse overseeing this these operations? Who are you contracting with? So this is you know there's a lot of you know in, in you know and this is this is nicely called by you know but Binance for example is you know it's regulatory ab arbitrage, right? So I choose the best for my operations, but in terms of regulations, it's not necessarily good for underlying clients, you know, and this is, you know, Bitfinex, another example, where, you know, Bitfinex basically is, is operating from the li license in, in New York, right, but effectively operating, you know, through different, uh, you know, um, entities around the world. And when you are signing up and you're putting your, you know, cryptocurrencies or money into this uh, entity, you're actually contracting with someone else under the you know, umbrella name of, um, of Bitfinex. So this is, you know, what we put basically is like, you know, how, what, what kind of risk you have in terms of uh, exchanges operating around the world. Another interesting part is, you know, when we, when we you know, look at the, how many exchanges would have AML policies and procedures, and so we find out that only 26% would have necessary, which is, you know, normally necessary, anti-money laundering policies and procedures, right? But interestingly, you know, the, you know this, this part, basically, these are without or with some uh, of the AML policies. This is trading which is happening on this exchange, which means that effectively, you know, the more, you know, you care about AML and KYC, the less trade you have. Similarly with, with KYC, 
So basically, the K, K, when we can talk about KYC is you come to the exchange, you know, exchange is requiring from you uh, identification, you know, proof of address, and et cetera, and et cetera. So this is not liked by any, any clients. Uh, nobody likes this, you know, and typically, you know, the, the, nobody's doing a good job in this, uh, in this space, right? It's, it's typically terrible, you know, cumbersome, time consuming, and et cetera, and et cetera. There's a lot of innovation at the same time, you know, happening in the KYC space, so it's gonna be improving dramatically. But at the same time, again, you know, um, I would say, you know, it's 69% of the exchanges do not have any or have some KYC, right? Which means that you choosing typically, you choosing, you know, the exchange, we do not care about this part. If they don't care about, you know, this, this part, trust me, you know, they're not gonna stay long on the market for, you know, any reason. They just take money and run away, that's one option. Second, you know, they're gonna be put in jail, that's second option, or just basically something gonna happen that, you know, they're not gonna be able to recover, recover the funds. And again, we, we took, you know, like we spoke about Binance, uh, we spoke about Bitfinex. You know, from our report, report we see that, you know, uh, customer due diligence, AML policies and procedures are typically in the high and medium risk category, which means that, you know, they need to improve dramatically in this space. So, and at the same, so, you know, and Bitfinex, you know, so the, the article which was published in CoinDesk was really interesting, you know, because the, the, you know, they actually did quite a good job with, with this article uh, because they actually, okay, you know, CoinFirm is saying that Binance do not have proper KYC. Binance is saying that they have, you know, proper KYC. So who, who is right? So, you know, they actually, one of the, you know, uh, one of the uh, guy from, from CoinDesk, you know, basically registered without any documents on, uh, coin, uh, on Binance, right? And, you know, he's American citizen and, you know, did some, you know, Bitcoin transactions. So it turns out that all the, you know, you who'd hear from the, you know, exchanges that they have KYC, they actually do not have it. Yeah, anti-money laundering, you know, policies and procedures, you know, you will hear a lot from the market that it's like, it's unnecessary, right? It slows down business. It slows down, uh, slows down business only when it's done not properly. And trust me, you know, I've this for, you know, I've done this for a number of finan large financial institutions before, you know, moving into crypto. And if done properly, it's actually really helpful. So more and more as well, you know, what we see is uh, jurisdictions which requires exchanges to have an anti-money laundering uh, coverage, what we call coverage, for any protocol or any coins or any tokens which they trade, right? So it's also important and it's changing, you know, Abu Dhabi introduced this uh, law, France, Switzerland, so this is something which is gonna be new. So what we see, and we're gonna have, you know, some announcement coming soon, uh, one of the largest protocols are, you know, integrating us as part of this solution. So it's really interesting move and really interesting uh, area of our expansion. Another part which we, you know, introduce also coming from, you know, some of our clients and some of our, you know, future clients is, you know, we want to certify the exchanges, you know, we want to be part of the analysis and assessment. And it's very important, especially, you know, it's, you know, partially part of the, you know, uh, if you talk to the regulator, you show that you are certified, there's someone who is doing audit for you uh, to check, uh, you know, what kind of risk you are, you have in the, in the, in the crypto space. So we introduced this uh, and it's, it's really interesting and uh, more and more exchanges are moving into the certification process. Interestingly enough, you know, so we, we, we know that it is cost. We know that this is actually, you know, quite, quite problematic for a number of exchanges, there's another layer of processes and et cetera. But what we see over time is if you get this right, it can be really effective, you know, from both from, you know, a process perspective, but also from the um, cost perspective. So I leave this with you and we'll be happy to talk to you after the presentation. Thank you very much.
Um, oh, okay. now I can hear it. Cool. Um, hi, so I'm Beth McCarthy from Starfish Network and DAO Incubator, and I'm going to be talking about state of DAOs, uh, which, as many people hopefully are familiar with, is uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, many people associate DAOs with uh, the DAO hack from a few years ago, and um, yeah, either with uh, that connotation as being, you know, this um, uh, kind of in the, uh, alternative investing scheme that ended up kind of going wrong and putting a bad name on uh, this concept, and I'm hoping that uh, as the DAO space grows and continues in the uh, direction it's going right now, then we'll be able to rethink that connotation and have people thinking about DAOs as um, instead of just being a investment mechanism or a way of organizing between uh, kind of individuals and these hippie environments <laughs> outside of uh, traditional finance and traditional legal systems, that instead it's something where we can create systems that are able to sit, you know, adjacent to and outside, but also within um, existing structures and create a more uh, equitable way of using people's funds and taking advantage of, um, you know, the freedom that we have with blockchain to uh, kind of reinvent the frameworks for collaborating together and coordinating. So um, there's these, I would say that the way that DAOs are kind of being defined in theory and the way that they actually play out in practice are starting to uh, converge a little more in the space. So um, Andreas Antinopoulos, you know, has this um, idea of like the corporation itself is a contract. That contract is the most critical one because it's the opportunity in which Ethereum can reinvent what it means to be a corporation in the modern world. The essence of a corporation, the decentralized autonomous organization, and you know, to break that down a little bit, then you know, what does it actually mean to be the essence of a corporation? I would say there's two different uh, connotations for that that. Um, fall into the two things that I think are useful for thinking about the state of DAOs. So one is kind of, uh, you know, a corporation as being a, um, or what the essence of a corporation would be. It's like, you know, a way of uh, organizing people together for an intentional purpose and having funding funnel through those people, also having responsibility, liability, fiduciary duty, um, you know, be taken on by people without uh, attaching to them as individuals. And yet the current legal systems, you know, no matter which jurisdiction you're operating in, um, you know, in the US and common law, like for all of those, then uh, there's still spaces between the traditional uh, traditional forms for kind of registering a business that, uh, you know, this kind of distributed team environments aren't able to encompass. So with um, decentralized autonomous organization, we're able to cut to the very essence of a corporation without having to deal with kind of these frameworks and structures that, uh, oh no, um, oh. Well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> to leave you with that, um, well, so what the second slide would have said, damn, okay, well, oops, sorry. Um, uh, so, you know, this, so this is kind of the idea in theory, like how can, um, you know, how can Ethereum and the benefits uh, we get with like blockchain from, you know, transparency, immutability, um, you know, having a funding source and payment source, uh, transcends traditional currencies. Um, how can this kind of decentralized dream actually play out in practice in actual legal jurisdictions? So um, some lawyers who are kind of leading the force on um, creating this understanding of these new legal frameworks, Marina Marquez, uh, Mark Zivik and Soka Efrai, have this working definition that they're using. So a DAO means a smart contract based hierarchical distributed and trustless network that operates according to transparent and stakeholder govern rules on a permissionless blockchain. So, you know, a lot of um, words there that have, uh, you know, particular meaning in the legal system and, um, you know, is this is a very technical way of thinking about DAOs, you know, in uh, contrast to saying, you know, DAOs are the essence of a corporation. So, you know, what does it mean to link those and how does it benefit everyone here? And the, I think the answer to that is, you know, decentralized autonomic or autonomous organization enables creation of states of being, collaborating and self-defining across spaces and industries. And um, so, you know, it's in terms of this idea of an autonomous organization, you know, one that is able to have 
procedures defined, protocols put in place, and operate you know, in a digital and physical environment um, on its own terms. And I think autonomic is uh, another useful way of thinking about that because it's like a self-regulating system, a system that ties in with others and also ties across them. And you know, there's infinite discussion that could be had of these, but just to go through kind of these different spaces, you know, legal, economic, social, political, financial, ideological, and governance, these are all kind of these intersecting disciplines that, um, you know, when people are uh, collaborating and coordinating with each other and trying to figure out ways to have businesses, trying to figure out way to have investment firms or kind of uh, platform co-op type um, scenarios, whichever um, of these forms of organization that people are trying to create across jurisdictions, then you know this each of these um, elements, you know, I think governs and intersects with each other. Um, and so that brings me to a tie-in of the workshop that we are doing in this room in uh, a few hours. And so what that um, you know, how do we actually take DAOs from you know the theory to incorporating how it exists in practice with these issues that are arising from creating new jurisdictions and new modes of liability um, and other functions that are normally played by these infrastructure players. Um, and I would say that's through a user-centric mechanism design, which would be you know designing the mechanisms through which uh, these organizations are able to power themselves in a way that has you know takes into account an understanding of the incentives of structures, value, um, you know, value frameworks and ideologies, economic realities, and um, kind of uh, financial and responsibility and fiduciary obligations of players. So, um, to you know, to explain kind of what this approach uh, draws on, then. Um, taking this uh, design thinking, design principles framework uh, popularized by IDEO and the Stanford D School um, that says, you know, if you're looking at a system and trying to, or looking at a product or an organization trying to understand where um, the space of innovation is actually able to happen, then you need to analyze the technological aspect, the feasibility of how much um, or how this uh, entity is going to actually operate on a functional level, like what is possible, you know, and is it going, what tools is it going to use, you know, is it incorporating AI, is it incorporating, um, you know, certain token engineering um, technologies, and uh, from a business perspective, how viable is it, is there actually a market for this, is there a defined industry, is there a profit model, how can it fit into the framework that VCs are interested in and also that customers are interested in, or, you know, in the case of DAOs, um, you know, is is this a non-profit model and how can we make sure that um, that's actually being put into play in, in an ethical way, which takes to this final kind of part of these concentric circles, the human values of usability and desirability. Like, are we building something that people actually need? Are we building something that people will actually want to use and that's usable enough that it's able to be extensible and adaptable across um, scenarios? And kind of tying all of those together is the um, addition that I think is super important that we start adding in to think about, which is dynamics. How do we think of this, you know, uh, Venn diagram as not being static, but instead being a dynamic system in which, um, you know, human values feed directly into um, business viability, feed into technological vi viability in a feedback loop kind of across all the different complexities of systems that we are now, you know, have the opportunity to kind of redefine and deal with in the blockchain space and a way to um, ensure that these dynamics are at play is by looking at uh, all the different dimensions that go into place of uh, understanding, um, you know, the aspects of the system uh, we can work with them here. And I think the way to go forward with that is to have a very thorough understanding of the stakeholders in the ecosystem, the governance um, uh, kind of policies and regulations that they want to set for themselves and how those come into play through uh, voting and other um, you know, participatory mechanisms. Then the token engineering um, like technological aspects that are able to actually take governance on chain and finally the uh, legal framework in which we're both operating and trying to sit, you know, outside of and adjacent to and self-define. So, yeah, you should talk to me more on Telegram or come to my mechanism design working group, which is digital uh, and uh, physical in Berlin and digital um, here to talk about these things more. So, and also come to our workshop today. <laughs> so, cool.
Okay. Hi, Ramon. Okay. Well, thank you, Beth. That was super useful. So I can probably skip the first half of my talk, but I need to first find my remote. So, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, so I'm Danny from Dao Incubator and Aragon Black, uh, doing the research and design of DAOs there. And basically, like continuing on what Beth said, uh, the work we're doing in DAOs uh, underlines two basic hypotheses. The first is that we can basically, with DAOs, multiply the forms of governance. So we can go beyond like simple you know, LLCs, states, uh, justice systems, but we can create modular systems that encompass these, but also add additional functionality and target more use cases. And the second is related to the work we do at Dow Incubator, which is that by being able to do these forms of governance, we can basically experiment uh, with governance and lead to like an evolutionary uh, analysis of these forms through basically creating a bunch of experiments, running uh, you know, this in the empirical world and generating knowledge that can be transferred without needing you know, a bloody revolution or a new election every time we want to change a system. Um, and so uh, our work at Aragon to support these two hypotheses first is to create a very advanced uh, set and framework of smart contracts that enables these and uh, that helps people create apps and UXs on top of the protocol. And so basically how Aragon works is that you have a basic client, but you also have a bunch of contracts which are not only related to voting, but also to transparency, to um, uh, financing and so on and so forth. So I want to show you a few very practical things um, that we are doing. Uh, yes. Yeah, so these are basically measures related to governance and to DAOs. Um, and these are basically like some of the basic building blocks that we use in our research to then get to real world DAOs. Uh, there's also a view of the DAO as a digital organism that is able to that's a bit fast, uh, that is able to, you know, have its own uh, functions and set of users and it manages to basically manage the resources and the will of the people within those DAOs, but also to communicate information and value between different DAOs and also taking from uh, the outer world and giving back to it. So at Aragon, we made a few applications of DAOs that uh, we hope people will, you know, contribute more apps and also build DAO experiments on top. So there is such a thing like uh, the dot voting, and this means that usually when you are in a project or you know, you're with a few friends and you want to you know, do a project together, you got to usually set up a bank account. You need to be sure that nobody steals the money. If there's a problem, you need to go to a judge. And the DAO framework is supposed to work in a way that you don't need any of those things, just with a few cents of transaction fees and a couple of minutes, you can set up that organization. Uh, one of the biggest problems uh, in cooperation is actually deciding how do we split the money or you know there's a work coming in and how do we split the funds so the dot voting basically says that according to how many tokens which are like your voting rights instead of the DAO those voting rights can be either you know egalitarian they can be meritocratic they can come from capital and all of these structures are modular you can uh, basically have like a weight uh, weighted vote of everyone who says like I think they deserve 10% I think they deserve 20% and then at the end of the voting, it aggregates everything and it disperses the fund uh, that is allocated to that project into it. And you can even put it at a level where it's like a lump sum transfer or it's a dividend that is like continuous on like the funds coming in to the project. We also are creating like the abstract machine, which is a decentralized publishing uh, journal for science, where basically you remove like the figure of the editor who is able to control or her able to control like all of the science that is going in. Uh, and it's actually the scientists themselves who get to vote what gets published or not. And this is based on a system, a protocol called uh, Pando that we developed and that leverages Aragon. And how Pando works is that it's a distributed version control system. What it means is that it's like GitHub, Git. Uh, you're able to track who did what when. And so given that system, you are able with the power of the governance to give people tokens for the work they performed. And so the work they did um, basically represents into them like how many percent they will have at every stage of the project and they're able to have a say on the project. This is very important when you relate it to AI because today um, 
some, like let's say the most famous algorithms, they're only detained by like a couple of shareholders or founders of the big tech companies. And if we're going to be in an age where AI is more and more important, it should not be just in the hands of a few, you know, party of or uh, shareholders of big companies, but actually the algorithm should be owned by not only the people who code them, but people in the ecosystem who could, for example, get a universal basic income based on them having contributed in some way or another to like data labeling or to, uh, you know, having a proof of humanity or having contributed code to the project. Um, so this allows you to go from like in the web where you had a lot of uh, tools to have people collaborate together, but in the end, they didn't have a way of sharing value together. So all the value sharing uh, distribution went into the hand of like Spotify and YouTube, etc. But here you're able to track at every point in the project who did what. And so you can basically, you know, um, give back to the people what they produced and the revenue that comes in according to the input that they made in the project. And this can be, you know, there are many methods of evaluating, like what is a contribution and, you know, we're letting this a bit open, but we're doing a lot of research on different objective and subjective criteria uh, combined with voting to get to assessments of like, what was the work done? Yep. Is it stuck? Back? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so to do this, we're also doing work on the legal side, and we created what is called the Contributive Commons License. Uh, this is because today, if you're a DAO and you start producing things, for example, you produce, I don't know, a movie, Warner Brothers can come and they can just, you know, release your movie and distribute it. And if you go to a judge and you say, we are a DAO, there is no legal status for that DAO yet. Uh, hopefully with Malta there will be, but also what we want to do is a set of licenses that is between open source and proprietary. So you are able to share freely the information. You, anybody can come and remix and work it, etc. But if somebody uh, makes uh, commercial use of that, then you can specify in the smart contract, uh, basically that, is ge that generates a legal contract that is signed by the DAO as a legal entity, and you can protect the DAO's uh, production as a commons that basically you know, has money coming in from the outer world and then redistributing it inside of the DAO or to other DAOs. You're also able, for example, to assign payroll to people in your project. You can vote on stakers. So this is basically live peer. So it's people voting to accept people who are trans uh, coding uh, some videos by giving the computational power. But you could imagine, for example, a proof of stake pool that uh, is managed through this governance system. There is also Altea. So Altea is actually an existing uh, mesh network. Uh, and so the problem of mesh networks today is that a lot of people just, you know, they use the bandwidth and there is no reason to give your bandwidth because you don't have like any incentive there. Uh, but this is an ISP that is a DAO itself. And so it's much cheaper because there's not the overhead. There's just some people exit nodes who buy a lot of traffic and then they are able to resell through the mesh network to the whole city. And so it's self-governed, it's uncensorable and it removes like these big uh, conglomerates outside of the equation and gives back to the people control over the internet. This is basically the app store. So anybody can go inside and explore the apps we have. Agent allows you as a DAO to perform operations in any other DAO. So like the DAO can, for example, loan money or it can, you know, uh, stake somewhere. So this is very modular. There's the pl planning suite, which allows you to do project management. You can assign uh, budgets to projects or vote on budgets collectively. Uh, you can assign bounties. You can give governance right with those bounties. Uh, there is Espresso, which is a decentralized Google Drive uh, in a way. Liquid Democracy app and Pando that I just showed you. This is how the Google Drive works. Uh, and so there's a particular thing in Aragon that is very special is that you have a modular set of permissions. So it's basically like an entire operating system that is called it onto the blockchain and it specifies who is allowed to access the resources and what conditions. So you can imagine thanks to these permissions that, for example, you have somebody who is like the CFO who can use like send transfer of money that is equal to 1% of the budget of the DAO every month. But for any other transfer above that sum, you need to have a vote of the DAO. So this is super modular and you can connect oracles to say like, you know, we're making a fund to protect farmers only if the temperature observed in an area is above like uh, this temperature for that uh, season. No, all right. I think it's out of battery, but yeah, I want to also talk to you about the governance of uh, Aragon itself. So how Aragon 
Shin is not a traditional company. Um, it's actually a DAO, and it holds like the funds that were raised in the ICO a couple of years ago. And so, for example, for me to you know be here or work for Aragon, I had to do a proposal, and I was voted by the token holders of the DAO. Uh, so these are all the teams who are working in it. So if any of you have like a project or something, you can also participate in the governance of this network and help it grow. And so the last one I wanted to show you is an app that we're going to release in the next month called the Fundraising App. Uh, this allows capital to come into the DAO to fundraise, and it's based on Vitalik uh, Daiko model, but it uses bonding curves, which I don't have the time to get in right now. Uh, but what it means is that basically you have like this bonding curves that incentivizes early uh, stakers to come in and they can stake on the project and uh, compared to STOs or ICOs where you know the people can just run away with the money when they got it or they have a bunch of money so they don't work so hard here there's only like a certain percentage that is given every period of time to the contributors of the project and so you are able to have like a dynamic system where incentives are aligned between like investors and collaborators in a DAO and Let's show a screenshot of it, but yeah, here it is. It's going to come on the mainnet this summer and on Rinkeby uh, by the end of the month, basically. So to recap, we're allowing uh, bringing capital into organizations, uh, letting users decide uh, how to allocate that capital and to allow uh, allocation of capital to contributors of a project. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Is the remote there? Good one. Okay. Hopefully you can all hear me. So, hello everybody. My name is Wasim, and uh, I'm uh, until recently was an independent researcher at a British laboratory called Parallel Industries. Uh, recently taken on a new position, which I'll get into in a moment. And the talk we're going to talk about today is the need for taxonomies for mechanisms to characterise and classify assets in this space. So the talk is called "Dude, Where's My Taxonomy?" You just saw my front slide; it's just disappeared again. So hopefully that will come back pretty soon. There we go. So let's uh, let's jump right in. So. <laughs> Yeah, I won't give you a very brief, uh, very uh, detailed introduction to, uh, to myself. I've been working in research for about 20 years, uh, first a physical scientist, chemistry, physics, astronomy, and so on. Uh, later on in uh, experimental music, arts, avant-garde, non-profits. Fell down the cryptocurrency rabbit hole six or seven years ago, and I've been developing a series of uh, empirical and subjective uh, conceptual lenses with which to understand, classify, characterize uh, cryptographic assets and networks. So I will preface what I'm about to say by um, making it really clear that what you're about to see is partially objective and partially subjective classification framework. So to some extent, you're seeing projections of my biases. But what I've built here is a generalized, customizable framework that anyone can use to compare and contrast the properties of assets and output something that's quite visually comprehensible to somebody that isn't technical. Uh, for example, a politician, a regulator, or a, a token issuer, something like that. So trying to squash lots of information into something that's quite visually uh, appealing. OK. And so I've recently taken on a position at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology at the MIT Media Lab. There's a unit there called the Digital Currency Initiative, which started off as a mechanism by which to fund uh, core protocol development on Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Uh, we are starting a new journal and conference series uh, and so uh, what we're trying to do is break down these traditional siloed these 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 gaps between the disciplines create a post-disciplinary arena for rigorous and intellectually honest cryptocurrency research so there's a link on the slide here uh, mot cryptocurrency research .com. we've released three newsletters so far and uh, you'll be hearing very soon about a series of events we'll be organizing in Boston first one is in October and uh, the call for papers for the journal will be coming out very soon so um, these are my own opinions. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a regulator. 
I can't tell you if your thing is within the law somewhere or it isn't. So with that in mind, let's move on. This project is called Token Space, and uh, it was motivated by this lack of clarity, this lack of understanding where we are in this industry. Uh, we see a lot of uh, very um, un nuanced debates about, you know, I think Bitcoin is money, I think Ethereum is security, I think STOs are this, I think ICOs are that. For me, these are very binary conversations that lack nuance, because what we see here are uh, assets and networks that have properties of many different uh, classical analogues. We're, we're seeing protocols, we're seeing assets, we're seeing commodity-like uh, characteristics, we see money-like characteristics. Some things look like unregistered securities. So how do we tease this apart and how do we move this conversation on? That's what we're trying to do here. So, uh, you probably, most of you probably remember uh, last summer there was a very senior official at the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States called William Hinman, and he made some comments that he thought that the 2014 token sale of Ethereum looked a lot like an investment contract, looked a lot like a security offering, but that by then, by the summer of 2018, it had become sufficiently decentralized that it was no longer uh, security-like assets. Now that's all well and good, but without defining uh, what those terms mean in that context, without giving some kind of um, line in the sand or some kind of objective parameterization, it's very hard to then compare that judgment with any other one. Now, we've already had this conversation with Bitcoin. It's pretty much universally agreed that Bitcoin is not a security. Uh, it doesn't meet many of the kind of classical uh, stipulations of something like the Harry test or the Silver Hills test, you know, investment contract, uh, uh, risk capital, expectation of profit, people you rely on, and all the rest of it. So these conversations we're having, like, is Bitcoin money? Is it not? Is Ether a security? Is it not? Like, we still haven't, we need to move this conversation on. We need to move this on to something a bit more sophisticated. So this is what I hope to do. And because, like, if we don't, then we'll be stuck in winter forever. And, you know, it's, it's cold out here. So let's, uh, let's try and thaw the ice. Okay. So I often like to uh, couch what I'm about to say by thinking about these networks as a stack of layers. So you probably are familiar with the OSI kind of network stack of layers. Uh, Vitalik Buterin had a really nice article called The Meaning of Decentralization, where he talked about this in terms of a, a ternary stack. I've just added an extra layer into that just to tease apart these things a little bit more. So when you have this, then you can start to contextualize some of these definitions like decentralization or permissionlessness or censorship resistance. So you might talk about the decentralization at the protocol level. Uh, the plurality and distribution of the nodes that operate the, the protocol, that message each other. Um, do some of those have certain privileges? Do some of those have certain responsibilities? And you might talk about the monetary uh, decentralization in terms of Gini coefficients, in terms of asset concentration and supply. And talk about the social and political uh, in this kind of you know, well-worn trope of blockchain governance and you know, do insiders control these things uh, indirectly and, and so on. So we're going to speak mostly about tokens here. So I think Danny's talk about DAOs, we're going to take a step back and I'm going to show you a framework that we can, in the future, apply to organizations such as DAOs. So, I don't think I need to motivate uh, this crowd too much about the differences between legacy assets and, and crypto ones, and I don't really have the time. But um, what I would say is, it's very helpful to think of these things. Um, I think the conversation has like reached a consensus that these things are largely commodity-like. People see these things as... Uh, you know, uh, limited resources, decentralized resources, or something like that. Uh, some people think that some of these have monetary characteristics, some of them don't. And some of them look like they might be uh, uh, investment agreements that, you know, receive on chain cash flows. Think about master nodes or staking or yeah, token sales, things like that. So um, I will jump on and just say that, you know, this. Uh, semantic uh, fog is complicated by the fact that we use the same words to describe protocols that we do to uh, describe the assets and so and the networks. So this is a little bit, um, you know, a bit of a confusing point and a bit of a nuance, but hopefully we can move past that. Okay, so I'm sure some of you have heard of Metcalfe's law, and if you haven't, you've probably heard of Moore's law, this idea that uh, computational power can uh, scale doubling every year, this kind of exponential relationship. The idea with Metcalfe's law is that the value of a network, or the value of uh, leveraging that network, is roughly proportional to the number of nodes that uh, squared. Now, this is all well and good, but uh, it doesn't really hold very well, because it will just extrapolate to infinity, and that will just suck all of the money out of the world, which, okay, may maybe that's what some people want. So think about... Uh, Alexander Graham Bell and his uh, first telephone line with his mother. 
that two node network was probably not very valuable to anybody except him and his dear mother. But as the telephone uh, network proliferated, it became very valuable. And then that essentially transmuted into the internet, which we know and love today as this uh, priceless network. What I prefer is the work by Nick Goldberty and Paul Johnson. Hopefully you can see the reference there. They've done a, um, a paper called Network Capital. Paul Gogarty has a uh, book called The Nature of Value, which I highly recommend. And they're using this network capital valuation theory, which I believe is the most advanced uh, approach to this to date. So the idea being, in a nutshell, that the price of something uh, in the moment that the transaction occurs is a function of the redemption utility so with something like a cryptocurrency, that would be to sell it or to trade it. If your, if your uh, monetary asset is a fish, you could eat it and so on. You have the network utility, which is the breadth of the protocol, who will accept that asset from you. And the speculative utility, you probably are familiar with speculative utility if you're in this room. The idea that the price of something that somebody will pay you may be different in the future than it is now. So you can also look at this through the lens of time. Time. Um, where we all know the price of Bitcoin yesterday. The price of Bitcoin yesterday is an objective fact that is recorded. The price of Bitcoin now is an intersubjective uh, phenomena. It, de it depends on who's on either side of the transaction and all the other factors that go into that. And the price of Bitcoin in the future, well, if you know the price of Bitcoin in the future, please come see me afterwards. So that is something subjective. We don't really know that. So, quick aside, I used to be a scientist, and uh, this uh, very distinctive gentleman with a uh, lovely, lovely haircut is one of the largest uh, or the most uh, renowned connoisseurs of the periodic table in the world, the chemical taxonomy. And so he has this rack of ties in his office, all of periodic tables. Uh, this, does this work? No. Oh, the small, let's go back. Yes, the small thing at the bottom of the slide is actually a periodic table etched into one of his distinctive hairs. That's the smallest taxonomy in the world. And that's him getting knighted by some guy. Okay, right. So that's what a good taxonomy looks like. We've got um, things are ordered and structured and detailed. That's what we want to go towards. However, it didn't always look like that. That's after several hundred years of experimenting empirically, trial and error, making adjustments. And oh, I just skipped several. Yeah. Mm, okay. <sighs> okay. Come on. I'm now going forwards, not backwards. Ah, okay. All right, all right, all right. Should have put it on a blockchain. Come on. Okay, so it's, we've, skipped a, we've skipped a couple of slides here, but basically what I was going to show you was um, some of the historical steps that were gone through to reach that mature taxonomy. So these things iterate in development. And the point I want to make to you is that today, we're not at the stage that we can build this mature like uh, schematic of ontology. We don't really know what these things are yet. This is actually very early. And so we're more in this occultist phase of mixing fire and water and nitre together to see what we make. So the, um, this is the latest state of uh, so-called taxonomies in the cryptocurrency token, uh, tokenized asset space. And um, I haven't got time to really deliberate why I think these things are not very good. So I'll let the emojis, emojis do the talking here. Um, but uh, there are a number of kind of best practices with doing classifications, which um, nobody seems to be following. So that's a shame. Here's a good one. This is from a called, paper called Don't Slip on the ICO by Fridgen uh, et al. And uh, what they've done is they've taken a whole bunch of to token sales, looked at the similarities and differences in them. So you've got things like a token supply cap. Is it capped or is it uncapped? The pre-sale pre discount was a token share for the team. Is there a funding cap? Is there a time horizon? Things like that. And they've uh, taken these into clusters. So they've looked at different populations or different sale types. And um, they've come up with some actually meaningful results. So that's the best one so far. So let's go back to our little um, news stories here. Talking about is an asset securitized or not? Are these things money or not? These things look like commodities. So what we can do is build an imaginary idealized graph with three dimensions with, on one axis, securityness, which is the uh, extent to which an asset has the properties of a securitized asset, commodityness, as to how commodity-like something is, and moneyness, how money-like something is. And if we have this, then we can start to plot these things in 3D space, and we output something that's visually relatively simple for somebody that doesn't have a full view of the technicalities of the networks and assets to compare and contrast these uh, uh, objects. Okay. Let's. So, 
and then take it a step forward further. Remember about William Hinman and his sufficiently decentralized uh, comment. So now let's imagine that this line is a regulatory boundary surface in some imaginary country, C cryptopia, let's call it. And so, uh, if uh, the Ethereum token sale was likely a security offering, that might be above the boundary on this axis. And as time goes on and the network matures and the use of the asset proliferates and the use of the network uh, increases, then this thing may have moved down through the boundary from the not cool zone to the, okay, this might be cool zone, let's, let's say. And it may be a line. You may not have a line in the sand. You may have some kind of traffic light kind of gradations. And each uh, jurisdiction may have their own way of slicing the space, and they may have their own way of determining these scores. I remind you again, this is at least partially subjective depending on how you engineer this, this, this uh, conceptual framework. So, this is what a taxonomy looks like. I'm afraid they're not very sexy, tables are horrible to put in talks, I'm sorry about that. But you've got things like, how functional is the network at a particular time? How useful is the asset? Is it proof of work? Is it proof of stake? ICO, fork, airdrop? Uh, how balanced stakeholders in the network uh, is the human primacy of the code based in the assets and so what, what you do with this token space is each of these categorical uh, 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 characteristics or each of these dimensional indexes that you range between zero and one you score them each asset according to these then you weight the average according to your uh, yeah you will come up with the formula for weighting and then you can squash all of this into a number and that one number will be the position on the axis that the characteristic. Can you hear me? Because my microphone's cutting out a bit. Okay, all right, all right. So again, sorry, more tables. Uh, let's skip on to some pictures. Oh no, yes. Okay, here's a picture. So this is what a token space looks like. This is the top 10 assets by market cap as of a couple of months ago. And uh, on the um, left axis going up is securities, across the bottom is commodities, and going in is moneyness. So notice that the axes aren't zero to one, because something like Bitcoin, I don't consider it to have a moneyness of one, not yet anyway. Like I still think that USD, Euros, Swiss francs, and so on, probably a bit more useful than Bitcoin on the street right now. Yeah, yeah shoot me if you uh, must. And so uh, what you have here is a few different uh, populations or types of assets, and it's nice to be able to visually compare contrast these. So, I mean, again, it's a subjective method, so what you might be seeing is a projection of my biases to some extent, um, but Bitcoin does seem to be out on its own. Ethereum does seem to be out on its own, but with a higher securityness uh, as a result of a token sale, a, a centralized foundation that controls a large amount of the supply, and other, you know, uh, insiders that, that tip the balance, and, you know, the human primacy over assets, as with the DAO exploit, and, and so on. You have things like Bitcoin Cash and Litecoin, quite similar. Uh, they're Bitcoin-derived proof-of-work networks, so that makes sense. But they have centralizing uh, leadership, and they may have, like, lower security. So then that makes these things less reliable as monies, less uh, immutable as commodities. Then you have uh, USDT, which is kind of sui generis. It's kind of its own thing, Tether. There is a debate as to whether Tether is a security or not. I don't know. Don't ask me. Um, and uh, then you've got uh, Ripple and uh, so XRP and, uh, and Stellar Lumens, um, which makes sense that they're quite similar. They're kind of these federated systems with a very high concentration of insider supply. And then you've got the uh, kind of ICO class of 2017, BTRX, EOS, which look quite a lot like securities, in my opinion, but uh, I wouldn't be brave enough to say anything certain. Okay, so once you've got something like this, you can then start to do some kind of like numerical and quantitative analysis. Now, this is a little bit, you know, not of that much meaningfulness with 10 data points, but I do it to illustrate so here. So what we're doing is clustering analysis, K nearest neighbors clustering analysis. Uh, K means nearest neighbors, and so that's with three, four, five, and six clusters. So it's just trying to tease apart where the different populations of assets might be in the space. And then this is what you might call a, uh, a agglomerative hierarchical clustering test. Think about the sorting machine in the post office that sorts the first class mail from the parcels, right? This is what it's doing. It's sorting on similarities and differences. And so it's, it's, it's arriving at a similar conclusion to the uh, three-dimensional uh, K means uh, clustering that I showed you. So, this is very busy. What I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to show you how the properties of these assets might change over time. This is a time-dependent token space. Now, I haven't actually gone away and calculated all of these numbers. I've just done this for illustration to show you that, you know, well, we all know that 500 years ago, gold and silver were much better monies than they are now. 
So the moneyness of gold and silver is decreasing. We know the securityness of Ethereum is decreasing. We know the moneyness of Bitcoin is increasing. So this is trying to plot some kind of time-dependent tra trajectory of these things. So. Um, yes, and to bring it back to why we're here, the idea is to extend this. Uh, this is like fresh work. It hasn't been published yet. I'm just uh, giving the first few talks about it. We've been working on it for um, quite a long time. And so we want to extend this to find ways that we can compare and contrast the characteristics of organizations, traditional organizations and centralized organizations like DAOs. So if anybody wants to help us build DAO space, please come and see us afterwards. And that's pretty much it. So thanks for your attention. And uh, this is how you can contact me. Thank you. Hi, everyone. All right. So it's been a long day, huh? Is uh, anyone not too tired, I hope? Maybe before we start, we can make a little show of hands. Um, so who here uh, believes that their government uh, could be very easily corrupted? OK, that's a lot. Uh, on the other hand, like n not corrupted at all or not corruptible at all? Yeah, one, one person, okay. And how many people think that it's, it lies uh, pretty much between, uh, between the two? Okay, all right, so bear with me then. Um. Great, thanks. So I'm Louis. I'm very happy to be here presenting um, what uh, we're doing with my company, 97, and we'll try to explore uh, how DAOs could be used by uh, traditional institutions to tackle corruption and make their um, functioning more transparent and more integral. So we're a small startup based in Paris with very different backgrounds. Um, not um, every one of us is, um, has a technical background. Um, and we are all pretty much, um, uh, we, we all believed that uh, Ethereum technology and blockchain technology in general uh, could be a great way to help governments and to help institutions work more transparently. So, um, okay. So um, we're tackling a problem which is a huge problem for humanity actually, um, which is corruption. Um, it is a plague that costs uh, more than one billion, uh, one trillion dollars a year uh, to the world government, uh, and that can be added to um, more than 1.5 trillion dollars that are um, affected in public markets that are um, uh, susceptible to be corrupted. So it's a very wide problem uh, that's also tackled by the United Nations and by many governments in the world, and. Um, we are trying to solve this problem, uh, not in the whole, because blockchain technology can do a lot, but cannot erase uh, entirely uh, corruption at large, but it can help tackle institutional corruption and how public agents can be corrupted uh, in, their, uh, in their work, in their everyday work. And uh, um, to do so, we uh, developed Kelsen, which is a smart contract framework and a decentralized application uh, to build incorruptible governance and incorruptible governance systems for public and private uh, organizations. So Kelsen is actually three things. Um, it's first of all, it's a methodology to be able to draw with just you know uh, pen and paper to draw governance models. It's a very clear and very simple standard that allows you to um, draw very easily and very quickly very complex or very large permission systems or very complex um, uh, yeah, sets of governance. Uh, yeah. So that's the first thing. It's a, it's a methodology, it's a design uh, to create governance model. Then once you've drafted your governance model on this paper, um, our smart contract framework will help you build this uh, governance model very easily. 
uh, and deploy it on any Ethereum-based network uh, of your choice. And then, once your system is deployed, uh, you want your users to be able to interact with it, right? So we developed also a decentralized application that enables um, citizens, public agents, um, anyone actually, to interact with the governance model according to the permissions uh, that are um, uh, granted to them. In, to them. So we developed Kelzen with a few design objectives in mind. The first one is to be a high security platform, uh, such a high security platform that it enables you to automate uh, legally binding decisions and make them rely on this platform um, so that you can really um, make your governance more dynamic, more transparent and more easy to operate uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it has to be respectful of users' private data and uh, users' right to secrecy. Um, it has to be simple, uh, accessible, easy to use, um, open, uh, first because it sits on a decentralized open network and also um, that lets you easily interact and connect with other applications or other platforms. And then it has to handle any kind of governance system that you want. Uh, knowing that our objective here is really to replicate uh, legacy institutions and we all know here that um, sometimes they have you know very complex um, ways of functioning uh, that respect sometimes uh, regulatory um, requirements or um, you know other uh, other types of, of complexity in the real world so the platform needs to be able to handle that complexity and also to let the governance model evolve over time because once uh, you've developed your governance, once you've deployed it, uh, everyone knows that organizations are not static and that it has to evolve over time. And so uh, Kelsen here enables you to do so. Um, so I I'm not going to dive in how Kelsen works uh, in detail because uh, we don't really have much time. Um, but what you can bear in mind is that we can uh, we, we consider um, governance systems as boxes or lists talking to each other. Um, so uh, you can take, for instance, um, a list of voters that will be uh, electing a board uh, or, I don't know, a president or a representative of some sort. And the outcomes of the vote will be stored in another list. And in our con in our uh, framework. These lists are called organs and they have actually three um, uh, permission layers. So the first one will be um, uh, managing who can add items to this list. Uh, so that's what we call administrative procedures and it's automated smart contracts. And then the other layer uh, is on the governance of the system itself and how we can um, change the administrative procedures and change how the system works. So you can really embed uh, the evolution of the system uh, into a democratic uh, due process or uh, at least a predefined uh, due process. Um, so to give you a very simple example of how concretely we could use it to tackle administrative corruption is to create a very simple Kelsen system with only two organs. Um, one that will be managing a public registry, so it can be pretty much anything actually. And by the way, all the examples I will be giving uh, from now on are um, uh, actual systems that we developed um, and uh, implemented in, uh, in our platform. So it could be a public registry, it could be, uh, for instance, a national business registry, it could be uh, you know, um, a voters registry, it could be um, anything that could be managed by um, uh, government or public institutions and that needs oversight. Um, so here you have uh, the public registry itself with its uh, own rules on how you can add or delete entries um, that are stored in the first procedure and then if you need to modify this procedure, you have a due process, what we call constitutional procedures, that will enable uh, registry operators listed, that will be listed in um, the second registry um, to, for instance, trigger a vote to be able to modify how the first uh, registry is, uh, um, is functioning. So that's a very basic idea. 
And you can see that really uh, Kelsen is, a, is like Lego bricks that enables you to build any kind of governance systems that you want and that lets you really replace these procedures and replace how they function um, uh, very easily in a, in a very modular way. Um, so yeah, next slide. Another cool example that shows also that um, uh, Kelsen systems are able to manipulate funds um, is the example of uh, participatory budget. Um, here in our framework, both organs and both procedures are independent smart contracts. And as such, they are able to manipulate funds. And here we drafted a very, very simple system with only four procedures uh, that enables anybody to be added um, on the registry of voters. And once you're in this registry, you'll be able to uh, manage the funds uh, that are held by the smart contract uh, of the participatory budget. So you'll have uh, a first procedure that will allow you to authorize uh, deposits, another one who will enable the voters to vote for expenses, uh, then a third one to manage who is um, a part of the participatory budget, and then the list of voters can also vote, triggering uh, P0, the, the constitutional reform, uh, vote for modifying uh, all, the, all the rules that I've just said, all right? So these are very, very simple examples. Um, and the idea is that in our everyday work, uh, of course, we implement way more complex systems. Uh, the idea being that um, we want to embed the maximum of the administrative processes onto the platform and onto the blockchain, whether it's public or private, to really enable the users of the service to be sure that um, their service is uh, operated in a transparent manner and that no one can tamper with it. Um, so here, I'm not going to dive in the details, but that's a very, very simple example of social security. So you'll have um, uh, insurance that will be added to the insurance plan, and then they will have different um, responsibilities within the system. And, um, and this is just a way to show that from a very simple service, you can really draft a, separa a, a true separation of powers that enables it to be um, uh, governed and managed in a very um, uh, incorruptible way. And, and then, you can build even more complex systems. Uh, we developed, um, just for fun, how the French constitution works, because we, uh, we're French. And uh, just to show that you, know, you can really build arbitrarily complex systems, uh, and that the platform, the Kelsen platform, will be able to, um, to handle it. Here, the idea is that you know, all these organs, all these different specific procedures to elect, like the president of the republic, to elect uh, the, um, the congress people, um, the house of representatives, etc., etc., they all can be modified by constitutional referendums or constitutional procedures uh, that follow a due process. So this is very important for public institutions um, to really prove that not only the service, but also the evolution of the service um, follows certain rules, uh, unlike, for instance, like Uber that could be, uh, that could unilaterally uh, change their tariffs and prices uh, or anything like that. So here, if you're part of the system as a citizen, as a user, anything, you can make sure that it will not evolve without your consent. So uh, these are all very nice, um, you know, very nice images. But uh, I invite you to try um, to try them live on our um, on our platform on dap.klsn.io. Um, so it's uh, it's functioning. It's live. Uh, you'll be able to you know interact with uh, demo applications, uh, vote, um, become candidate for an election, uh, vote for public fundings or participatory budgets. Uh, all the things I've just presented it there. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're interested by uh, these kind of applications, uh, we have three main activities uh, in our everyday work. Uh, we provide blockchain strategy consulting, um, uh, support service for uh, Kelsen applications and Kelsen systems that will enable you to deploy your system very easily, even if it's a very, uh, a very big system, if you are a public institution.
education, for instance. Uh, and then we provide education and workshops, both technical and non-technical, uh, with like introductions to uh, blockchain technology, to its social impact, um, you, to the token economy, and also, um, you know, um, education for developers on uh, how to uh, introductions to solidity programming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, uh, to sum up, uh, Kelsen is uh, a framework for building uh, transparent and incorruptible governance systems. Uh, it's open, it's modular, it's adaptable to any change in the governance uh, or the organization of a service. Uh, it's totally free and open source, and it could uh, help uh, public institutions be more transparent, function more transparently, and prove to their audience uh, that not corrupted, uh, bringing more trust in the public sector uh, or corporate organizations um, and uh, allowing new forms of local or international governance uh, that could help tackle corruption worldwide. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. So, um, my name is uh, Gustav, and I'm responsible for the business development of MegaDAO in Europe. I'm also one of the driving forces behind our expansion into Africa, and also doing quite a bit of the partnerships we have in Asia. Uh, today, I'm going to go over a little bit of like how Mega is set up and how we kind of like as an organization try to facilitate uh, our ecosystem. Uh, so first off, um, a little bit on my background. Um, up until joining Maker, uh, I was living and working in Argentina. Uh, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, you know, Argentina has a very, very high inflation. So I kind of come from a background where I experienced the financial instability and kind of like the, the, the how the situation is if you are in a place where the local government simply cannot handle uh, the control of the financial system. Um, so a few basics about DAI. So DAI is equivalent to a dollar. We're currently soft pegged to the US dollar. Um, we kind of like based the entire system on the concept of uh, like cryptocurrencies, a global access and decentralization. But at the same time, we also saw the apparent need for uh, stability in the assets for, amongst other things, business transactions. I mean, there's a lot of people who's completely fine with speculation, but if you're trying to base uh, the foundation of your life or a business on it, it simply just does not work. Um, we are a completely decentralized stablecoin based on Ethereum. Um, we are asset-backed, uh, but compared to the other big centralized stablecoins like Tether that operates after the IOU model, uh, we have created a system of smart contracts that allows users to lock up funds on the blockchain uh, and we will then, based on the value of those funds, allow them to take out a line of credit. So every single position on the blockchain is created uh, individually. Um, other people cannot redeem your credits on that one. So it's basically uh, a, a big system of small uh, positions of loans. Um, we have everything from you know, people lending like a few dollars against Ethereum to people taking out millions of dollars against Ethereum. Um, currently, we are only backed by Ethereum, but later this year, we are launching multi-collateral DAI. And in regards to that, we will open up for a variety of assets in our smart contracts, not only uh, focus on the blockchain, but also going to have stuff such as security tokens in our assets. And at that point, we will really become kind of like a combination of a central and commercial bank 
directly living on the blockchain and governed by the token holders of our protocol. Um, so I'll just go into like a little bit about DAI, like peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. Um, we have a lot of use cases around it. Um, within the crypto space, we work with a lot of the Web3 interaction. Uh, we work with a lot of the bigger dApps in the Ethereum space. We have also bridged our token to other blockchains to enable interaction with the decentralized system from other blockchains. Um, and then I think some of the things that I'm very, very excited about is some of the things we're doing for regular people and like some of the more traditional environments. So we're having quite a bit of traction in South America and in Africa. We're really starting to, to move forward there as well. And we're basically able to give people uh, a dollar exposure, but we also have a lot of uh, decentralized products being built on top of our protocol. So we're kind of like, we really supply the infrastructure for other people to build tools that can help people in their everyday life. And all of it is, gov is governed by a completely decentralized process. So you can really have faith in the transparency and process of the system. Um, some of the things that we're doing that I'm really excited about is, for example, we, we are setting up services where I'm not sure if you're familiar with some of the other lending protocols like Compound, Dama, or DYDX. Uh, but basically, they allow you to, to lock up uh, DAI and receive uh, Compound today was around 9% per year. And DYDX is sometimes all the way up around 17, 18% per year. Uh, so what we then take is that we take it through our partnerships. Uh, we take kind of like the possibility to go uh, from fiat directly into DAI, straight into like a staking, and thereby you can actually give people in those regions like a dollar savings account that pays them a minimum of like 7, 8% per year. I don't know if you guys do investments traditionally, but it's like a pretty good return. Um, and I think this is just kind of like to show that we, we are one of the projects that is a non-blockchain that really focuses on facilitating our ecosystem. Uh, we see some of the bigger projects uh, on Ethereum doing that. We saw Daniel presenting earlier as well. Uh, but we have really thought about like, how can we capture you know, like the partnerships in our ecosystem? How can we work with these projects as much as possible? Uh, so therefore, we have really created kind of like a strong uh, ecosystem around our project where we work with a variety of apps and dApps and, you know, also exchanges. We have a lot of people building statistical tools and management tools on top of our protocol. And one of the big reasons for people doing so is because we really help them to facilitate the possibilities uh, after they do so. So to do so, we, we kind of like both have like a very engaging uh, business development team, which I'm part of, but we really try to make sure we unlock the entire ecosystem and network of Maker for every single project in it. So we're very open to, you know, giving introductions and setting up meetings and kind of like see how we can formulate partnerships across the board. Another thing is we also have a grants program. So we give uh, grants to projects dealing with uh, diet adoption, uh, social responsibility and financial inclusion. Uh, they usually uh, are around uh, like twenty-five to hundred thousand uh, dollars, and this is something we give. You know, like th there's like very little commitment to it, but of course we need to see that you know you spend the money on on what was agreed upon, and we kind of like go in and act as an outside project manager, helping the project you know achieve the goal that the money was was given to them for. Um, and this is this is something that we're doing because in in part of like us becoming like bigger at maker, we're really trying to you know kind of like you know, distance ourselves a little bit uh, from the Maker protocol itself, as we are the Maker Foundation. And the Maker Foundation in itself is a, is a more centralized entity, where MakerDAO is completely decentralized. So unless we kind of like manage to detach ourselves over the next few years, um, it will become, you know, like quite apparent that we will have like too, mid, too big of like a, a vote in the system, right? So these are some of the things that we're really trying to do, you know, trying to facilitate other projects, making sure that everyone competes on equal terms. Um, and after we launch Multicollateral Dial later this year, uh, this expansion will become even bigger. And we'll also launch a VC, where we will start uh, doing actual funding into uh, bigger projects in the ecosystem. Uh, so some of the thing, other things that we do for the projects as well is that we, we help them with, like, uh, integration with uh, back-end services that provide on and off ramps. So basically giving them fiat gateways uh, that can be used in different regions. So on this one here, this one is not quite updated. We have quite a few in Europe now as well. Uh, but this is basically like an overview of, for example, we use in, in Africa, we use CoinDirect. 
uh, in the US we have Wire. So right now you can actually set up an application where it uses the, the backend of Wire and the backend of KBI do it through uh, CoinDirect, through an API setup, and you can send dollars to, for example, Nigeria uh, very, very fast and very, very cheap. Um, and this is something that we have seen uh, a very, very big need for when we engage in conversations with these projects, you know. A lot of them, they're very, very interested in doing something with crypto, doing something with DAI. But then again, right now, we just don't have the world yet where you can actually pay with crypto. So it actually only really becomes money for people when you get it out in fiat. Um, some of the other things we participate in is, for example, Project Bifrost. Um, I think this is, this is one project I think is very, very cool. Uh, it's basically like a consortium, uh, consumption of different blockchain companies that like went together to try to create uh, like s sustainable funding for disaster relief. So in in the chain here, it's basically oh I'm missing a slide. Okay, sorry, but but in in the chain here, it's basically uh, us through Maker allowing people to send uh, cash to an NGO. We then help the NGO convert the cash into DAI. We sent the DAI to the disaster relief zone. In this specific uh, use case of Bifrost, we did it uh, to Syrian refugees in, I think it was in Turkey. And then we, through uh, DEFAS uh, network, we then off ramp the DAI locally. So we get people to buy DAI for local fiat. And then we, ta we took the Turkish lira and uh, used that as disaster relief for the refugee camp. Um, and this is some of the things that, you know, we, we're really, really trying to increase the use cases more of. And we're putting a lot of focus on, on developing these things uh, together with our partners. Um, then we also have kind of like the other spectrum of the end, where we also work with more uh, traditional institutions. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with TradeShift, but they're the biggest supply chain platform in the world. Uh, they have 1.5 million companies using their database uh, and platform. And basically, they are allowing for uh, financial services go to, to go to between uh, companies in the supply chain. So in this specific partnership, we are looking to uh, tokenize uh, the invoices being sent on the platform, uh, and then taking the tokenized invoices and using them as collateral in our system, and thereby giving people access to, to liquidity uh, outside of the traditional uh, factoring uh, system. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with factoring, but it's basically uh, like upfront payments on invoices that do usually 90 days later. Um, it's a pretty predatory market uh, with very, very high interest rates and something that's not available to a lot of people solely based on region. Uh, so here we're really trying to, you know, go with like the core concepts of Maker, which is, you know, like global and equal access to the financial system, as well as not being dependent on the local, uh, the local government for a stable currency. Um, and really, you know, we, we are ourselves as well, actually a, a non-profit foundation. Uh, so all of this is something we really do because we, we believe in these things. Um, currently, we're, we have a lot of talk because we're kind of like in the middle of this like very hyped uh, decentralized finance space. Uh, we don't really see ourselves as competitors with the other products here. We see kind of ourselves as like an enabler and, you know, kind of like the, the first of the big ones. Uh, and a lot of them are, are based on, you know, actually using DAI as like the main currency of, of their transactions. Um, so yeah, you can also see we have a, a pretty big uh, dominance in the field. I think it's slightly less now, around 84%. Um, so yeah, so basically like the core concepts of Maker, like what we want to do is we want to, you know, unlock the power of the blockchain to create economic empowerment. And we don't believe that the services that you receive should be based on things such as, you know, race, location, uh, origin, or any of these other things. You should really, you know, have the equal and fair access. We don't see why someone in, in Africa should have different terms than someone in Europe, uh, only based on location. Um, yeah, so what's coming next? Uh, we have multi-collateral DAI. Uh, this is very, very interesting. Uh, we will basically allow a lot of real-world assets to enter our smart contracts. Uh, we're solving some of the issues. Uh, we see the security tokens in regard to secondary markets, some of the things we're working on right now. Uh, this will be released uh, late summer, um, hopefully, and that will come out with, uh, I believe it will be one of the first uh, fully formally verified uh, smart contracts in the space. Um, we're also releasing the DAI savings rate, which is um, 
uh, this, the current fee you, you're going to pay for having uh, a loan with us, that's going to be split into two. So one of them is going to go for the, to the people who use DAI. So we're going to be an interest-bearing stablecoin that pays out a compounding interest every hour. And then we're also going to be releasing synthetic assets. Um, we already released one together with UMA, where we actually released a, a DAI-backed token that were, is pegged to the S&P 500. Um, I can go into that setup if any of you are interested uh, afterwards. Um, but basically, we will also start releasing other currency types. So we also have a Euro die. We will have a Great British Pound die, South African Rand die, Singaporean Dollar die, and basically create uh, a lot more assets that will be backed by this completely decentralized system. And not only currencies, but also uh, you know more investment products, so we can get exposure to, for example, American stocks, even if you're living in a country that wouldn't allow it. Um, yeah, so if you want to join our community, we have a very, very active community. Uh, we have a subreddit with a lot of activity. We also have our internal chat where we have uh, all of the team members ready to answer any questions you might have. Um, yeah, so um, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks. Oh, oops. <laughs> oops. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know. I didn't think about that. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. And Perfect. And can you put my um, thing back up? Thank you so much. Oh yeah, you should get a mic though. Yeah. Hey, so good to see you here. <laughs> oh, thanks. Okay, I didn't think about this being here when I said that. Um, whatever, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Okay. Huh, <laughs> this thing is crazy. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Could you take a picture of us doing the workshop? <laughs> oh, Come thank you. Closer. Oh, my God. Yeah, that would be amazing. Whoever. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so they're bringing in a whiteboard, but I can go ahead and get started on just um, talking a little bit. So if you look, um, <laughs> all the TVs are like not facing at y'all. Um, but yeah, so you know, in my talk I mentioned uh, mechanism design bridges, um, kind of design thinking with systems thinking to, um, you know, take this design framework of saying, uh, you know, innovation and um, and by innovation or how I at least define it, it's like, you know, adaptability, extensibility, um, you know, like the, uh, how something is actually going to be used by people and come into the market. Like, um, you know, this kind of the center of design thinking, uh, this 
uh, whatever, design thinking Venn diagram, and then um, also taking into account the systems dynamics at play with actually um, having these different factors interacting in a system. So, you know, technology, the feasibility of something that you're building, um, business, the viability, uh, and then, you know, human values, which I would also consider legal to be part of that, like how it interacts with human systems. So, um, uh, in terms of thinking about DAOs and prototyping like a minimum viable DAO, then um, I identified four dimensions uh, that need to be considered in order to actually, um, you know, have a DAO that is like, you know, a functioning organism or organization. So uh, mapping out stakeholders in the ecosystem, how that flows into 